Ma me vana se ma Pen Dream TV. Pen Dream TV diye osye dem yopo. You are tell for a ha e Pen Dream TV mpacho. Oni nse ye diye news na to for ma ne ye di brew. News ya uba be ti mpacho. Se owa jintre bia na zowa jintre bia na zowa jintre fa. News bia ya presente o platform mo yusua. For your voice note na fa sen ye. E wo 0277-128777. Diye dibe tu Pen Dream FM so. Ma gana fo ni nati wonka. Yenko ni yenko ti e ne story ya di brew. And this traditional ammo. Uh, Solomon, how is the butterfly doing? Yes, yes. Allergy is behaving as if he's not a chief. <laughs> <laughs> and that I am permitted to do it. He's also a chief. Aren't you? Well, I saw your chiefly thing displayed in Tamale. <laughs> around the agri uh, traffic light. That's true. That's true. So I. That's true. I was thinking that I will be able to hide today and uh, <laughs> <laughs> under the cover of <laughs> anonymity. You are known. You are known. <laughs> hey, I say you people are not doing well. Oh. Le, le moment. Yes. We are, we are fighting. Okay. Kisi. Uh, in fact, since I met Doctor Kisi in the studio, I met him the first time in this studio. I've never ceased to admire him. Uh, but since he's, since, since he's gone to parliament, uh, I think that the whip system has affected him briefly. Psychologically. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> not psychologically. <laughs> not only psychologically, but, but also physically. Mm -hmm. So now, let's start by putting things in perspective. The human sexual rice and family values bill proper. proper family values bill has been passed by parliament mm. it is not no, no longer subject to debate it has been passed so what the justification or otherwise or the arguments that were made in canvas and parliament are odious. They are no longer relevant. So we should, we, if we come here and we engage and spend our time arguing that, relieving that, we might be creating an impression that it is still available for debate. It's not. What is available for debate today is whether when a bill has been passed by Parliament in accordance with Article 106 of the Constitution, the president has authority to refuse to accept it when it is so transmitted. And that is what the people of Ghana are looking for education on. Now, the issue again is if you have an overbearing executive, how do the various arms of government react to such a monster, a creature? How do they react? That's also the issue. Because in this country, all constitutions have been dictated by our experiences. All constitutions. The 1957 constitution was because we were coming from a colonial administration. It was virtually imposed on us. The nineteen sister constitution, Nkrumah thought that that constitution should be presidential. That constitution should not have a, a deputy a, a, a vice president or a, what, what do you call it, vice president. Yeah. And that constitution must not countenance political parties. So it was our experience because in the view of Nkrumah, you needed to bring everybody on board to push the agenda of development of the country. The 1969 constitution, having looked at the 1956 constitution, or the 7th constitution, having looked at the 1960 constitution, the drafters of the constitution thought, we do not have a bill of rights in the 1960 constitution. We do not also have the office of the ombudsman to check 
abuses of rights of people. We also were, had practiced the presidential system of government, which we thought had vested too much power in the president. The NL, NLL were pro-conservative. Uh, uh, okay, so the heavily favored a Westminster type of system. So Buzia was appointed the chairman of the National Council for Civil Education prior to the promulgation of the Constitution and prior to the return of the country to constitutional rule. He greatly influenced the outcome of the 1969 Constitution. So our history again dictated that in 1969 we had a prime ministerial system of government where before you could become a minister, you ought to be a member of parliament. Where if you were a member of parliament and you were made a minister, you were not vetted. Because if you are qualified to be a member of parliament, you are equally qualified to be a minister of state. So that's why when you look at the 1969 constitution, there was no requirement for vetting. To our history. Then that, that constitution was toppled. He said, we didn't serve as well. We went to a 1979 constitution. And we said, oh, since we had gone prime ministerial, let's go strictly presidential system of government. Strictly. Where we have a rigid constitution. Rigid. The three arms of government are separate and distinct. They should not use. They should not cross each other's paths. You can't be a minister if you are if you are a member of parliament. If you are a minister, if you want to be if you are a member of parliament and you want to be a minister, you must resign. That's what the 1979 constitution said. So strict. Then office of the ombudsman, human rights, everything, I mean, but strict. And because ministers could only come from parliament, you must otherwise qualify to be a member of parliament. So you can only be appointed with prior approval of parliament. So that's when, that's the first time that requirement entered our constitution. Then it was toppled. They would do okay. And then a very important historical development that influenced our 1979 constitution was that because we had strict separation of powers, Le Mans budget had to suffer. We almost ran into a constitutional crisis. There was an issue of protocol. If a minister and a member of parliament met at a gathering, who was to be given the pride of place? Who was to be acknowledged first? And so many people, things came out. So when the 1979 constitution was toppled and we were given another opportunity to come up with a constitution, we said, let's fuse the two systems. So we had done the Westminster type, we had done the strictly presidential type. So what is happening today is a fusion of the Westminster type of system that we want, the prime ministerial system of government and the presidential system of government. It's a fusion. And the level of that fusion is Article 78.1 who says that the president can appoint ministers from parliament, a majority of which, I mean, his minister, a majority of which must come from parliament with prior approval of parliament. Now, so, when you have a constitution that promises you prosperity and equality of opportunity, you have a constitution that has Establish the architecture of governance. You have a constitution that is heavily influenced by the doctrine and principles of a separation of powers. You have a constitution that limits the exercise of governmental power of the various institutions. As members of, as a former member of parliament, and I, I believe Honorable Adumako as a member of parliament must strive to uphold the tenets of that constitution. Especially when just two weeks ago,
two weeks ago, we were in Kofredua to celebrate our fourth republic. And what was the theme? Our democracy, our pride. Our democracy, our pride. They cannot be democracy. We cannot be said to be practicing, practicing democracy if we violate the, the fundamental principles of our constitution with impunity. We cannot be democratic. Our democracy, democracy is not hanging somewhere. And our constitution is hanging at another place. No. It is our constitution that has given us our democracy. We the people, and when you take the preamble, I see the constitution on in front of Adamako. We the people have elected unto itself ourselves a governor, a government. And that government, that government can only exercise its powers in accordance with our what? With the, with the constitution. So come back. Article 58 is clear. Executive authority of states is vested in the president. 58, clear. 298. Executive authority means the power with which government acts. That is why when the president said, oh, I'm government, in his last State of the Nation address, I said, you are perfectly right. And that even though I have advices, but the buck stops with me. He's, he was talking about the eminent domain, Article 58 of the Constitution. No qualms. But that power must be exercised in accordance with the tenets of the Constitution. If you fail, refuse, or neglect to do so, you become a tyrant or a dictator. That's how dictators are made. They ignore. Ah, Nkrumah. When you talk about Nkrumah, say, oh, he was a dictator. Man, you go back and check in history. Before Nkrumah took a decision, there will be the propagation of a law. And he will follow the law. Because Nkrumah was acutely aware that if you don't follow the law in taking decisions, accusations that you are a dictator will be well founded. So Nkrumah never took a decision with a first law, a law being in place. And then he will follow the law to do what he wanted to do. But if you fail to follow the law, it becomes a problem. And I had great admiration for Nana Akufado when he was a practitioner. In fact, when I was a practitioner, I met him severally in court. Everybody loved to listen to him argue. And sometimes we mimicked how he argued. But Nana Akufado as a private practitioner and Nana Akufado as a, as a president are separate and two distinct persons. Whereas he was a practitioner, he was diligent. Mind you, you remember Apollo and the Apollo and the Republic. Who, who argued the case? Nakufado. Why? Because he thought that what President Liman had done was what? Unconstitutional. You remember the thirty first December case? MPP against the Attorney General. Who argued the case? Because he felt the use of public resources to celebrate a, a day which is a day that celebrates a, an overthrow of a constitutional government is not consistent with the letter and spirit of the constitution. So what, what has changed? Minya, Adebena Asasa, the law. 93.2 says that Parliament, subject to the provisions of the Constitution, shall have the legislative power of the state. And legislative power or authority, it means the power to make laws. Ours is a bifurcated system in bringing laws into being. It must be passed by Parliament 
and assented to by the president. No law can be called law, properly so called, if it is not passed by parliament and assented to by the president. Don't you see a system of checks and balances there? <laughs> so, so you have to see clearly the constitution was forward looking. Now, so parliament, when it, is, it is exercising that power, because the constitution says subject to the provisions of the constitution, Article 93, subject to, subject to the provisions. So, when it is exercising that power, that power must be based on the constitution. And where is it? How does it exercise the power? Article 106. So there must be a bill, there must be a memorandum to a bill, it must be laid, it must be gazetted, it must be referred, it must... So it is only when Parliament in exercising that power does not follow the procedural requirements under Article 106 that you can send Parliament to court. Because it will have done what? Violated the express provisions of the Constitution. That is why Speaker Bagbon, and to be, let me hasten to say that I admired the clarity of the statement made by Parliament, by Bagbon to Parliament and the merit of the logic. Because when a bill is passed, and I'm happy that I'm sitting here with Kisi Adumagu. Member of Parliament, and I pray Solomon or Bernard also get there. Because when you get to Parliament and you experience the procedure and practices, your argument and your understanding of parliamentary proceedings improves and appreciates. When the bill is passed, because there is an amendment and the, the bill did not come to Parliament, the uh, human sexual what rise. A family proper, he says such a yeah. proper, a proper family mm -hmm. values, values bill, bill. Yeah. did not come to parliament in the way it left parliament. That also. True. <laughs> true. true. <laughs> yes. A lot of inputs. A lot of inputs. <laughs> so, when, and those inputs are not made secretly, they are made during the consideration state. They must be advertised. And you must be privileged if your input is not advertised and the speaker gives you an opportunity to make them you must be in a privileged position because because of the issue of transparency accountability you must advertise the inputs so that you give people notice so that they can also go and research so because those this all these things are made on the floor of the house the clerks after the bill has been read the third time and passed, have to gather all the d debates, go back to their offices, work in reconciling all, produce what the, the, the product they think Parliament had done, send it to the speaker, he looks at it, if he's satisfied, they send it to the printers, government printers. To do three hard copies on parchment paper, or, or, or is it five? On parchment paper, bring them back because the in putting the typesetting the, the legislation, the government printer can also import some things into the law. They proofread it again, and when they are satisfied that <laughs> that is the law that they pass, a certificate is issued saying that they followed the procedure and this product is veritable is a veritable product of parliament that's what together with the five copies they then said to the president that's what they did so followed the constitu constitutional imperatives where is parliament at fault and it is the constitution which says when they finish that they must present it to the President, that is where my surprise and worry starts. 
The president in Article 1067 is given a veto power. Ananya, sir. He's given a veto power. Assent or refuse to assent. That's a veto power. He, said he has a discretion. In how many days does he have to do that? Seven. And if he decides not to assent, Article 1068 says that, oh, you know, you do a memoranda. You do a memorandum to Parliament stating why the relevant provisions that reasons. reasons why you say you would not. And you have how many days to do that? 14. 14 days. Now, if in the wisdom of the president, like uh, Honorable Kisai Dumwako has said, I've written down what you have said, oh, hmm, it will affect our money. It will affect, this is purely a private affair. Why are we bringing it in? It will affect the business of government. I mean, this is needless. I don't think that we should go this way. If the president comes to that view, he might not be able to take the decision alone. But that's his view. He does what? He refers the matter to the Council of State. The Council of State has how many days? 30 days. The question is, why was Bidia 2 in a haste? In all this, I'm talking about two months ago. Yes. Why was Bidia 2 in a haste? It can only manifest an intolerant president. Then come the Attorney General. He says, oh, I've advised the president not to sign to the bill. So that the advice of the Attorney General has been carefully crafted. He didn't advise the president not to accept the bill. <laughs> he did it. He did it. He said, but hold on. Don't sign. And that is consistent with what I'm telling you. Referring it, take it to parliament. That's consistent. Uh, so it's very carefully crafted. And when Bidiato was referring to it, he didn't read in between the lines. The Attorney General was telling you, accept the bill, but don't assent to it until the determination of the matter. That I have a problem. That I have a problem. But he had to give justification for why he was advising not to assent. So probably the justification was what was in court. Nowhere in the Constitution is it provided that when the president is submitted or presented with a bill, he has to reject the bill. Nowhere. So when I hear people say the president is a law abiding president and so I ask them, so what law was he abiding? <laughs> so I asked them, so what was the law? <laughs> He's a law abiding president. So what was the law? <laughs> I mean, because me, I don't see what, he, what law he was abiding by. I don't see what law. So if you know somebody knows, you tell me, this was the law he was abiding by. <laughs> so I don't see it. What beats my imagination is the fact that the president secretary could write a letter threatening the clerk of parliament. If this is not impunity and arrogance, then I don't know what that, that is. The clerk is known to the constitution. The clerk is known to the constitution. He is the person who has been given the responsibility by the constitution, our democracy, our pride. To send that thing. Is there any mention of executive secretary in the constitution? No. And by the order of things, the clerk ought to be higher than the executive secretary to the president. Then you write and say, seize and desist. And you say that our democracy, our pride. Yeah, you say that. Ah, even if you wouldn't want him to bring it. Is that the way to write a letter? 
Joseph was. Because you are dealing with two equally important arms of government. Equally important. Not a superior, not a, an inferior. Equally important. That is what caused the umbrage of parliament. That's what provoked the air of the speaker. Because the speaker too is the head of parliament. He has a duty to protect the dignity and sanctity of parliament. In fact, it is the constitution that gives him that responsibility. That is why when Adubaku is speaking in parliament and castigating me on the floor of the house, I'm not in parliament. If no one rises to defend me in parliament and say, oh, I'm not here, so don't speak about me, Adumaku cannot be sued. I can't sue Adumaku. I can't. So when par parliamentary immunities and privileges are not granted for nothing, they are granted because the the, a democracy is consolidated on free speech. So as a president, you must respect that. Let me tell you the absurdity of what the president has done. And that has come before. I say history must be our guide. In 2009, after 10, somewhere Atachia and some group of lawyers, do you remember, yeah. made their way to the Supreme Court on a Sunday? That was in 2008. 2008. What was their purpose? To restrain the Electoral Commission from doing what? Declaring the results. It was cut. You remember? Yes, yes. That was on uh, after the second round. After the second round. You remember? Yeah. I think that was on the second. That was in 2009. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, that was yes. on the second. Yeah. To restrain the Electoral Commission from declaring the results. Put this in parity with what the president has said. So, if in 2024, after 7 December, or before 7 December, somebody goes to court and sues the Electoral Commission, files an injunction, interlocutory injunction to restrain the Electoral Commission from conducting the elections and declaring the results. It has not yet made its way onto the course list. Has filed his writ, his statement of case, and affidavit in, in, in verification of the facts. It's President like. President has been served. <laughs> everybody has been served. <laughs> what happens? That's confusion. That's why in taking a decision of the nature that the Nako Fado Secretary Nako and his took, they ought to have thought deeply because it has repercussions. Can you, in all honesty, Adumako has won elections, freely conducted elections, competitive elections. He's gone to Parliament to do his work. There's no evidence that he has not met the requirements under Article 90, what, 7, or is it 98 of the Constitution. He's met all the requirements. And somebody goes to court to file a notice to restrain and to As a member of Parliament. And because he has filed at the courts. We have to wait. I don't we should not go and perform. Impossible. Ah. I can give you so, and all this exam, this both two examples I've given you are springing directly from the constitution. It is the constitution. If medical doctors do that, then plenty of people will die. Plenty of people will die. <laughs> Before I cut you, I have to go to court. Ah. But anyways, I mean, I'll let you talk. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So the. This example has given you raises a fundamental issue. 
will it be legitimate for a court of law to injunct a constitutional body from performing duties prescribed, prescribed by the constitution? It will turn them on to an amendment of the constitution. That would mean that the judiciary now it will be more powerful. powerful. Or even the executive. Because they need to you see, so, so jurisprudentially, when you look at what the president has done, you simply, I don't get it. I don't simply get it. And as a student of democracy, as a student of politics, as a student of law, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind because it has got die but it's dangerous. It's certainly a dangerous precedent. And that is what Mr. Bagman said. He alluded to the constant and consistent pattern of treating parliament with, dis with contempt, with disrespect. Alluded to the fact that the president himself had in the past said that what parliament had done was unconstitutional when the president was not clothed with the power to pronounce on what parliament had done. And to demonstrate, to demonstrate why it, it was important for the president to understand the ramifications of his conduct, you know, he then invoked uh, the Fiamma Qua. <laughs> he invoked the Fiamma Qua, not because he wanted to invoke the Fiamma Qua. He invoked the Fiamma Qua to demonstrate the absurdity of what he had done. Uh, people, I don't, I don't know, and some people when I hear now, they don't No. I mean, when the president said he would sign those three bills earlier and said they were unconstitutional, the parliament stopped working. They worked. You must locate what has happened or what happened on Wednesday squarely within the context of the letter written. By, because you can't even treat an officer of parliament with that level of contempt. Me, an individual, even me, a member of parliament, the parliament sends me, I mean, to come, you invite parliament for a meeting or the constitution says, and I go and you treat me with contempt and I report to parliament, parliament will take offense. Let alone the clerk of parliament. Let alone the clerk of parliament. You can't do that. Even, even the dignity of the person, of a person, is invulnerable. The constitution tells you that. The, are we are here. Then you treat a person as if it's a lesser person. The Constitution says that you can't do that. The Constitution. And these two gentlemen are lawyers. Two elephants. <laughs> They're lawyers. But now they're the most uh, lawyers. They're lawyers. Of high, high status. It's London. Well, or what, did, what did they think that what did they think that the import of the choice of words in the letter was meant to carry? was to portray the clerk as a lesser human being. And the person said, you can't do that. And, you see, the constitution further says that when the president or the council of state sends their recommendation or advice to parliament, and parliament is so predisposed to passing the law, they pass it by what? Two thirds majority. Two thirds majority. And when they pass it by two thirds majority, the president has no discretion. But to do what? Sign. To sign. So there are elaborate procedures. Elaborate. So why would we be put in this needless tension? And now everybody's talking about the business of government suffering. Now who cosa? Now who cosa? On goal. On goal. on goal. And it is not that it has never happened though. And that's why I have tremendous respect for President Kufo. Mm -hmm. I didn't agree with him and I told him that in a meeting.
that even though I didn't agree with some of the policies that he pursued while president, I respected him tremendously because he knew what he was doing. President Kofo knew what he was doing in this country. When the domestic violence bill, you remember? And the inclusion of the clause, clause that was interpreted to mean marital rape. When the bill was passed, packaged, and presented to Kofo, he didn't say, don't bring this to me, I don't want it. The churches and the monks are all up in arms against that. I don't want it. He accepted it. And within seven days, or 21 days, he wrote back to Parliament. And said, oh, I have serious concerns about the inclusion of this particular. <laughs> and, and, and that was all. He didn't even suggest amendment. I know he didn't suggest amendment because that amendment, that provision in the clause, in the bill, is my formulation. So, when he came back to Parliament, that was the year I went to Parliament, 2006. That was the year. I was not even yet on any committee. But when I was passing by, Esther Obin Dapa, who was the gender committee chairperson, had just been reassigned from the Ministry of Lands and Forestry invited me, oh lawyer, President Kofo says he won't sign this uh, uh, bill because we have included the uh, marital rape. Uh, can you look at it and uh, help us see whether we can come up with something that is acceptable? I took the bill, I read it, I didn't even sit down. Read it, juggled, I mean, uh, uh, invoked my common sense understanding of the uh, invocation of marital, you know, uh, conjugal rights. Because in common law, you can't rape your wife because it is presumed that consent is given at the time of marriage. So I invoked my understanding of that. I looked at the modern dictates of the feminist movements, <laughs> and I looked at the uh, provision and I juggled the words. I just juggled, changed the positions of the words in the, in the bill and introduced a caveat. Everybody was satisfied. The only person who saw that what I had done was almost the same thing, but in another language, was the late and the boring. He saw it. He saw it. But all, everybody, including President Kofo, was satisfied. And when he went back, there was no tension. And as I've said somewhere, that that's how intelligent presidents act. They take advantage of the law and go in tandem with the law. And bring the country together. I like you. You'd have to wrap it up for me. And then, oh, this thing, I can talk to Debra. <laughs> yeah, I realize. That's why I said you have to wrap it up for me. I, I, I have, there's so much you can say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, there's so much I can say about, about it. But my last, last comment, and I'm greatly disappointed in Asante Bidia too. Because, like I said, he's a lawyer. And I knew him before he became executive secretary. Mm. I've, I've gone on platforms with him before. Where a president, your president, you are serving a president, and your president has been painted in the character of an intransigent, intolerant, overbearing president by your own party. The least you can do as his humble servant is to help manage him. You don't reinforce it. You don't reinforce people's perception about the president. What the letter did was to reinforce what people have been saying about President, B, President uh, Akufado being a, a constitutional dictator. You've heard that word before. Mm. Being a tyrant. Yeah. Being an intransigent person. Just recently, somebody said it on... That, that letter reinforces that. And... You don't serve your president. You serve your president, and I told President Mama that my understanding of service, even though it was a privilege, was that one, I had to protect him. As a minister, I had a responsibility. He appointed me, he appointed me to protect him. Two, to help him to succeed. They were the two things I thought my appointment meant to me. If you are an appointee and you don't know this, then you should be relieved of your appointment. Hmm. Alaji, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you just join us, the mother of all talk shows, Alaji and Alaji, we are talking about.
Mama ever I say ma Pen Dream TV. Pen Dream TV dia o se dem yopo you at for a high Pen Dream TV in Pacho. Oni say the news na talk for man e di bro. News e awu baba ti in Pacho so wa din we want din tire bia na so wa din tire fa. News bia I present your platform o so for your voice note na fa send here. E was 0277 128777. The debate to Pen Dream FM so magana for nyina ti won ka. Yen ko nyen ko ti e na story e di bro. 